In this video, we're going to carry on learning Blender slowly by doing some additional practice. Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this next part of our Learning Blender Slowly series, I want to continue to do some practice. We've talked about a lot of different tools, different ideas, things that we can use to, say, extrude or scale or rotate different selections. And we've played around with a lot of different tools like loop cut and slide, bevel, and extrude and inset. And at this point, I think it's good for us to continue to practice, to have a small goal to try to make something and then just see where we may need to work a little bit more on potentially using shortcuts or finding the right tools. And from there, we can continue to progress. But the whole idea of this is to make sure that we understand how to apply what we've learned. So we're going to start with the default cube. We're going to go into edit mode. And we're going to begin deleting some faces. So I want to use this as my starting point. So I'm going to shift select the top face, which will keep it uh, deselected and all the rest will stay selected. Then I'm going to go to mesh, delete, and I want to delete faces. So this is going to leave me with one face and I'm still on face selection. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this face and this is going to be the basis for some new shape that we want to make. So what I'm going to do is go to the side uh, still selected, so I'm going to use G on the keyboard and Z to simply move it up. Then I'm going to use R and X to rotate about the X and start to angle it. Now obviously in our different series we've talked about modeling cars, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to create a basic hood shape. So we're going to use the edges, I'm going to select the front edge, I'm going to go to a side view here, and I'm going to extrude it out. So E on the keyboard will allow me to extrude this. And I just want to create the general shape here. So then I'm going to rotate this and select this back edge. And again, I'm going to use E on the keyboard. So that back edge is selected, E, and I'm just going to bring it back and sort of make this generic shape. E again to extrude it. Now we can rotate this around and see what we've done. So again, we're just kind of creating this basic shape here. Now at this point, we need to think about bringing these edges further out towards a wheel arch or, or a wheel well, right? So we can hold down Alt to select this entire edge. So Alt and left click will allow us to grab that entire loop. And now I'm going to do this from a front view. I'm going to use E to extrude. And I'm going to bring it over and down a little bit. And then I'm going to click E again over and down a little bit more and click. And notice at this point, we haven't really talked about mirror or symmetry, and I'm not going to worry about that just yet. There are some things that we really need to understand about that. I'm only focusing on this one side, noting that we can add a mirror modifier. There are some other options that we can do, like toggling on symmetry across X, Y, and Z. So these are different options that we, we can talk about, but I think right now, just learning to use these tools and learning to create something is more important than worrying about those little details. So now that we've extruded this a little bit, obviously we, we just did some very basic shapes. So what I want to do is I want to start to adjust to this. I want to move this around. So I'm going to use scale, and I'm going to use scale in the Z direction. And again, this is going to let me bring those edges more in line. Then I'm going to use G and Z to sort of bring them down. So kind of put them into that, that sort of uh, straight line from the side. If we look at it from the front, it's fairly straight. From the top, you can see everything is still nice and quad oriented. So we're gonna go back and we're gonna add some more detail to those, but what I wanna do now is I wanna create an arch. I wanna bring a cylinder into this. And the cylinder is gonna be placed exactly where the 3D cursor is. So this is our opportunity to play around with positioning the 3D cursor. So from my front view, Remember that we can do a shift and right click to position that 3D cursor. And what we wanna do is we wanna find the center of where we want that cylinder to be. So from the front view, I'm gonna just shift and left click and just position it roughly right. When we go to X, and we look at it from the side, I'm gonna put it somewhere over here. And as we rotate around, you can see that 3D cursor is out in space. Well, that is not precise positioning. What we did was we simply moved it to a place where we think that that arc is going to go. So now we can go to add and we can select a cylinder. Now a cylinder comes in the wrong orientation and we have a dialogue down here. 
that allows us to do things like rotate. And we can manually enter values here. Once we are finished adding the cylinder, this dialog is gonna go away and we won't be able to get it back. So we can make changes in here. We can manually use G, R, and S to you know, rotate it and scale it. But one of the main things that's important here is the number of vertices. That's gonna be important to us. I'm gonna reduce this. I'm gonna make it pretty low. So you can see that it's down to 12. We can make it even smaller than that if we want. But now what I wanna do is I want to rotate this around. Notice that there is a cap fill option and I'm gonna set this to nothing because I don't wanna cap the top. We're gonna to generate UVs. The alignment is based on the world and then we're going to rotate it about, in this case, the Y axis. So when we select here, if we, um, before we actually click in here, you'll notice that there's an, a left and a right arrow the cursor changes. If we hold down the left mouse button and just begin dragging, it's going to act like a slider. So while we can manually enter that 90 degrees, we can also use that option. If we are not sure which direction we wanna go, we can kind of use it as a drag and slide. So now it's in roughly the right position, but we wanna scale it up. So the radius right now is one meter. And again, you see the arrow is the left and right. We can just begin scaling it up till it looks about right. So as we rotate this around, you can see it's positioned exactly where our 3D cursor is at the center of it. So the location is shown here, and that's based on our world coordinate system, but the object itself is placed at our 3D cursor. So if we wanna make adjustments, say in X, again, before we click, we can sort of move it around. If we wanna look at this from a front view, we can use these options to sort of position it where we want. I'm gonna stick it just a little bit outside of our other mesh body. Then we need to decide how many divisions we actually want. We're gonna delete part of this. We're only gonna keep maybe the top half, but you can see that 12 looks like it's probably about right. So I can hit the left click just anywhere inside of Blender, and you can see that that dialog is gone. And even if I select this again, it's, it's not gonna come back. So now I wanna go to my face selections, and I'm going to get rid of these bottom ones. X on the keyboard, and I'm gonna delete faces. Again, you can go to mesh and delete, and delete faces here as well. So now we have two mesh bodies that are inside of here. And one benefit of the 3D cursor location is now if we select edges, if we hold down Alt and select this end loop, what we can do is we can hit E to extrude. And then before we click anywhere, hit S on the keyboard, and notice that we're scaling outward. Now, if we hit escape, this is one common thing that happens when you just begin modeling in Blender. That edge is still selected, and if I hit G to just move it, notice that it's there. So even though we canceled out of the extrude, we didn't accept the scale, what actually happened was that new edge and the faces associated with it were just, they were created, and you might not necessarily know that. So if that happens, what we can do is we can go to our mesh and clean up, and there are some options to do things like delete, and you'll notice that we have these options to merge by distance. And when we do merge by distance, one thing that can happen is it'll allow us to basically pick some values and figure out if we can combine anything. So sometimes that works uh, to help clean up a mesh. You need, to, you need to select it first, so we wanna box select everything, and then we can go and we can try to do cleanup, merge by distance, and, uh, and again, Sometimes you can get that to clean your, your meshes up. There are some other options in there, but in reality, what you wanna do is you just wanna be careful that you don't accidentally uh, sort of create that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit G and G again, and I'm gonna slide that front edge. So now I don't have an extra edge in the front here. So if I click Alt and select that and move G, you can see that it's sort of just there. So what we wanna do beforehand, especially when we're not comfortable with shortcuts, is we wanna think long and hard about where we're scaling from. So we don't have to go back and do a bunch of work. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select that edge again, holding down Alt and left clicking. So you can see that whole edge is selected. We can rotate it around. We don't need to be in a normal view. And then we have these options up here. We've got transform orientations, and then we've got the option here for transform pivot point. So right now it's based on the median point, the median point, which is that orange dot back there. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this to my 3D cursor. Now, if I hit scale, you'll notice that if we uh, view this, you notice that it's scaling out based on our 3D cursor. So I'm gonna hit escape. 
I'm gonna go to X. I'm gonna hit E on the keyboard to extrude. Then I'm gonna hit S to scale. And you can see now that we're scaling relative to the 3D cursor. Those bottom edges aren't going down in the negative Z direction anymore. They're going out from our 3D cursor. So since we are creating the, the cylinder object, the cylinder mesh body, and we're doing it at the 3D cursor, using that 3D cursor for things like the scale or transform orientations can be really helpful to us, especially as we're creating things like a consistent width lip around a cylindrical body. So I'm just gonna drag this out a little bit. I don't really have uh, you know, an ideal thickness that I want here, but now I'm gonna go to my front. I'm gonna hit E again to begin extruding. And you can see that I can sort of just bring this back and I'm overlapping or I'm going where these faces already are. A part of the reason I'm doing that is because I don't necessarily want to keep all of these faces. I might decide that the shape we create from here is better. And maybe I want to alt and select this and use G on the keyboard and just move it back somewhere as well. So these are all things that we need to consider and think about. I'm going to use control Z to undo that last one. I'm going to hold down alt to select this edge here. And I'm going to use G to sort of bring it out a little bit. So as we're in the concept phase, as we begin sort of playing around with these shapes, we want to continue to work in plane whenever possible. And again, we don't have to have our view in plane. We can use G and X, Y, or Z to lock an orientation. And in this case, what I want to do is I want to scale. And I don't want to scale completely. I want to scale in the Y direction. So I'm going to hit Y on the keyboard. And you can see how that allows me to flare those out. So you can see now I'm, I'm sort of making the, the shape of this a bit wider. And you'll notice that this vertex is now pretty close to here. What I wanna do at this stage is I'm gonna go into my vertex menu and I'm gonna use the knife tool. So you can select it here, you can hit K on the keyboard and I'm gonna select this point here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna create a knife cut along these vertices. And then I'm gonna hit enter to accept that. And then now I wanna go back to my faces. This body, if it's getting in the way, we also have some isolation tools. You'll notice if we expand this that we don't really see multiple bodies here because they're part of the same object. But we can rotate this around. We also can, can see that our cut actually affected these edges. So we're gonna take care of that in just a second. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select these faces here. I'm gonna hit X on the keyboard and I want to delete the faces. So again, we still have quads everywhere. We haven't changed that but now we've just sort of restructured it. For these edges, if we wanna fix this, we're gonna to go to our edge selection. We're gonna select these two edges, hit X, and instead of deleting them, we're gonna dissolve edges. It'll allow us to get rid of those edges and maintain the geometry. So if you accidentally cut through something like this, if you're working with two objects, then you can use dissolve to sort of help that out. Now let's think about the shape of this. If we're happy with the, the hood transition shape, we can use our vertex selection and we can begin merging things together. We do want to be mindful of where our divisions are. So things like holding down alt and selecting this entire loop, then using GG to slide it will allow us to sort of move these into position. So again, alt will allow us to select the entire loop. So hold down alt and grab that GG to slide that. And you want to position these roughly in the right location where we think we're gonna combine it with another mesh body. So again, Alt, G and G to slide. You can see that we're getting a lot closer. This back edge here, we can't slide out. We can move it. So we can use G and Y to move it in the Y direction. And then we can sort of think about where this vertex needs to be. If we wanna pull it down to here or pull this one up to there. Okay, so now again, we've been playing around with this, going kind of slowly but sort of looking at the concept of combining two bodies together. Now from the side, it looks pretty good. From the front, however, we're not even close. So I'm gonna go to my vertex selection. I'm gonna take this edge and I'm gonna say G and X. I'm moving it in the X because I like where it looked from the side and I just need to sort of move it back. And you can see over here, we can do the same thing. And again, I don't have to be in a normal view. I can say G and X, and it's only gonna allow me to move an X, and then we can sort of rotate and make sure our view is okay. So now we need to decide, are we going to bridge the loops between these? Are we gonna add more geometry? 
or are we going to merge them? So in this case, if we're happy with the flare shape, what I would suggest is that we merge this vertex to this one. So we're going to select both, we're going to hit M, and then we're going to merge at last. Now, if you're not comfortable with the shortcut, then we can go up to Mesh, we can go down to Merge, and select at last. Obviously, that takes a bit longer. So just using M on the keyboard for Merge, it'll also remember your last selection. So you can see here, it already has the cursor at last. So it makes it pretty quick. We just select here, M at last, and we're gonna do this one here, M at last. Keep in mind when you're making these selections, I'm gonna actually Control Z and undo. Keep in mind when you're making these selections that you wanna use Shift, because if we hold down Control and I select this, what that's actually doing is it's looking for the shortest path to connect those. So if I go from here to here, holding down Control, you can see what it's doing is it's actually selecting all the vertices that go along. But if we hold down Shift, then it's only gonna select those two. So very important that you don't hold down Control. And I know in some cases, in some programs, Control and Shift do the same thing. It will be different here. So then merge at last, and now we put those two together. So what we've done here is essentially we've created a wheel arch and the starting of a hood, and we've sort of combined them together. But we don't really have a nice smooth body. So one thing that we can do, which we've already done before, is we can take this low poly object and we can add a modifier. So under our modifier stack, we're gonna add subdivision surface. And then we can start to increase this to increase the number of subdivisions. And you'll notice something that happens here. It leaves this hard crease on the edge. It hasn't actually smoothed, you know, adjusted that and smoothed it out like we would expect it to. I'm not gonna apply this modifier. I am gonna go back into edit mode and select tab. I'm going to select the entire body. We can use A on the keyboard to select all if we want. And when we do that, we want to, we want to make sure that the normals or the, the transition between these two is nice and clean. If you want to look at this manually, we hit N on the keyboard. You want to make sure that a, a bevel weight wasn't accidentally added. And in this case, it's not. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to um, Mesh, Normals, and we're going to recalculate the normals. And as soon as we recalculate those, based on the combination of putting these two bodies together, you can see now it's smoothed that, that corner out. It's smoothed that edge out. So this subdivision added a lot of uh, extra layers. If we turn off optimal display and we look at just sort of the wireframe, the viewport shading to show the wires, then you can see the number of divisions we're adding each time. So if we set that to zero, this is our low poly object. This is what we created. We set it to one. It's going to divide each of those up into four. So each of those quads comes four quads. And then it, of course, doubles and it just goes exponentially from here. It can get out of hand really quickly. So you want to be sure that you don't come in and add a ton of subdivision just to get it to look good, because we can always right click and shade smooth, and that'll help smooth that out. So it takes all of those faceted faces, and it will, it will sort of turn them into a smooth version of it. So we're looking at it on the screen. And again, the optimal display will allow us to actually see the subdivisions that we're going to apply before we actually apply them. So if you wanna see the, the number or the level of faces that you would get if you applied it, you can turn that off and go into your wireframe and it'll, it'll kind of show you that. Um, also note that we can always go back into our edit mode. And if we change the optimal display, you'll notice that it didn't change anything here. We have the smooth body underneath and we're still seeing that low poly object that we created. There are some additional options. We can turn on and off the display here. You can see that we can uh, actually push those vertices to the surface, or we can have it be the control cage. We can turn it off completely when we're in edit mode, but when we hit tab and go back into object mode, they're still smoothed out. So play around with these. They will change different options. This one will be for rendering. This one will be for the view. If you want to turn that off, it's gonna automatically turn off all these other options. But you can see here that we now have a good starting point. There's a little bit more that we wanna do here though. So I'm gonna hold down Alt and I'm gonna select this edge. Now, there are a couple things that we've talked about is adding a crease versus inserting additional edge loops. And we've looked at that in a couple examples and we've talked about why that works or sometimes when that works, how it works, and sometimes when it doesn't. 
in this case, the crease is actually going to be a, a decent option. If I set this to 0.5, it will allow me to bring that crease out. And if I go to Alt and I add a crease here, and then I go into my object mode, you can see that that gave me a pretty good result. Now, again, if I go into this optimal display, uh, or turn the optimal display off, I should say, you can see that the subdivision actually looks pretty good. The subdivision is a good solution in this case, and it works well because we have all quads. We didn't triangulate anything. We didn't have an end gon that we created in here, and it worked really well because we had all quads. Now, we could also still add control loops if we wanted to control this better. So control and R, and then we can sort of pick the orientation we want. In this case, I want to put it in here. I'm going to push it out closer to that crease. I'm going to do the same thing on the outside, bring it in, and then I'm going to hit tab to go back into my object mode. So you can see that does a really good job of controlling that. And again, if we turn off optimal display, one thing you'll note is that we, we end up with a lot of subdivisions in here because we have the edges closer together, or we didn't really have it down here. We just used the crease. So these are things that we need to consider, and we want to be careful, again, with um, how, much de uh, how much geometry, how many details we add too early in the design. Just be sure if they're actually needed. And in this case, uh, additional subdivisions will help clean up these edges. So tab to go back in here. We could also alt and select this and remove the mean crease and take a look at how that changes our design. It sort of softens that edge up, but because we have three edges relatively close together, you can see that we actually still have a pretty decent crease. And when we go to our optimal display, we turn that off. You can see it looks very similar in this, uh, but when we zoom in, again, we have these edges. They're being subdivided. So if you have faces close together, when you're in the object mode or edit mode and you have these faces close together, each one of those is going to be divided up the number of times that you use in your subdivision modifier. So just keep in mind that you want to be careful adding too many. So these control loops here, I could hit X and I can dissolve that edge and then I can see that it smoothed it out. So then I can come back and I can say Alt, select that, add a mean crease, tighten it back up a little bit. And again, just sort of play around with these, figure out how much control you need, adding edges, adjusting the crease weights and so on. Now let's go back and let's use a mean crease on this edge here. We're gonna do this top edge. I'm gonna hit Alt, select that, and I'm gonna add 0.75. Give it something that's, that's sort of really tight. When we go back into our object mode, you can see that we've added that crease. So you can, you can kind of tell that the subdivision is causing some shading issues around the top and the bottom here. So with a case like this, where we're not completely on the edge of like the wheel opening, if we're between smooth surfaces, then we really want to be careful and we want to try to add those loop cuts in here. So again, pick the direction. I'm going to bring them in relatively close. I'm going to pull this up. And then when we take a look at this, now you can see that we have a harder crease. And if we really just want a softer transition, we can remove the mean crease from that. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually use the crease as maybe a temporary modeling aid. I might put it in there to sort of uh, minimize the number of edges I have early on. And then if I decide that I really want to change that shape, then I might come back and adjust it. You do have to be careful once you start adding a lot of these because then what you end up having to do is make a lot of selections if you want to make, modify this. So for example, if we're going to move this up in Z, then I had to select both of those end edges or three vertices in order to make that happen. Then if I want to sort of crease this a little bit more, if I want to raise this up, we have to think about whether or not we're going to be raising just the middle edge or if we're going to raise all three together. So for example, if I say G and Z and I just bring this middle edge up, you can see that I've added the crease but we have to be mindful of the fact that it might dip back down. So this can be a fun exercise. We can use faces, edges, or vertices. So for example, I could take these two G and Z and just move them down, give the, the hood a little bit more of a dip. And um, then we can just take a look at how that looks. So you can see here, it can be fun to play around and just work with these shapes, get an idea of, of how you can transition between them, how you can insert new objects, and how you can add details. There's one last thing that I want to do here, and that is 
crease this edge. Now, the reason I want to do this is because this one ends right here at a corner, and we want to see what happens when we add a crease to it. So I'm going to use 0.5 again. I'm going to hit tab. And you can see that it looks okay. However, the shading that happens at the corners is problematic. So you do need to be careful with something like this where you add a crease that ends at a corner like this. So I'm going to hit tab. And I'm going to use Control and R. I'm going to add some additional loop cuts. I'm going to slide those out. I'm going to add one up here, bring it in, help me control that edge a little bit better. And you can see that it's still causing problems here. So for a case like this, where I have this shape and I'm, for whatever reason, ending here, I would probably avoid using the mean crease. I would set that to zero. And then I would take these edges and I would use G and G on the keyboard to slide them in closer together. So this one here, again, Alt and left click, G and G to slide along the edges. And then now you can see that we got that pretty, pretty smooth crease. We need to do a little bit more work up here, but we can still get that good result just by using those edges and not using those creases. So just be mindful of, of this and it's very geometry dependent. So there are some times where you might find that it works well to use a crease and other times where you might find it's more problematic. For something like this, also keep in mind that we can take this individual vertex and I can use G and G and I can slide it. I can widen that there. I can take this one here, G and G and slide it. Take this one here, G, G and slide it. And then what I did was I took that crease and I smoothed it out as I got to the front of the fender. So I didn't carry it all the way to the front. I transitioned it into another shape. So again, these are all little things that with sort of no end goal in mind, so we didn't really have a, an end plan or a shape we were trying to follow, it can be fun to just sort of start creating. This all started from a single face from that stock cube. We played around with uh, extruding edges. We created a cylinder with the 3D cursor. We extruded from that 3D cursor or relative to it instead of the bounding box center. So that was helpful in order to create that lip. And we looked at things like adding creases and, and sort of moving this geometry around. I think it's really helpful and I think it's an important step in the learning process to do this. And for me, uh, it, I found it extremely helpful to play around with shapes, even if I didn't have an end goal in mind, just to play around with shapes, move things around, see what you can create. And when you don't have something you're trying to fit to, if you don't have a shape you're trying to get, it gives you a lot more freedom to explore the tools and just move things around. Remember also, unlike uh, you know other programs where you're dealing with parametric CAD data, we can duplicate this. So I can use Shift and D to duplicate this, and then I'm gonna move it in the Y direction. And now I have this second version of it that we can modify. Now keep in mind when we go into tab, if we duplicated it in object mode, that this is a completely new instance. It's gonna have all the same topology, so we can work with either of those. If we're in edit mode and we use A to select all and shift D, this second version is going to live inside of the same object. So when we do this, if you happen to duplicate it while you're working on it, then you wanna hit P, which is separate, and you can do by selection or by loose parts. If we do by selection, then it's gonna put it into its own object in your collection. And that is, you can find if you go to mesh and you go down to separate P on the keyboard and you can do it here as well. So keep in mind those options are pretty handy, especially if you want to create sort of an original low poly version and you wanna play around with some different changes. So for example, maybe in this one, we wanted to get rid of this edge. We can do it, dissolve edges. Maybe we wanna get rid of the crease up here. We wanna do X, dissolve edges. Now we can sort of take a look at the differences between those two shapes. This one has harder edges because we had more control. This one is softer, but maybe that's the route you're going. And then this one over here, we can hop in, we can select an edge, maybe use GG to slide it over further, select an edge, GG to slide it over. And then we can just see the difference. The hood transition is softer because we don't have those same edge creases or controls. So this one is the same, you know, we deleted some, but kept them close together. This one has more edge control, so it's a tighter crease. You can see the shadows. And then this one here, we simply move them a bit further out. So a great way for us to practice and sort of play around and figure out just the tools, figure out the tools. 
So at this point, that's as far as I'm gonna go with this example. I do think that it's really good to play around with this. In the next video, I think I'll start to talk about using mirror and symmetry because that's gonna be the next step. If you're trying to model a car or really if you're trying to model anything, then you wanna learn how to add symmetry. Uh, I'll probably use this example uh, just further. So I'm gonna save this version. And if you make anything and you wanna to continue to use it, make sure that you save it so you can play around with adding symmetry and see how that works. But for right now, that's gonna be it. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the video or send me an email. And as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.